Greetings, everybody. Peter Maravillas here. On behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to a special edition of City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar. Tonight's event is being brought to you by City Lights in conjunction with our friends at Synergetic Press. Our program is called Decolonial Futures and Environmental Justice. We are joined tonight by Dr. Vandana Shiva in conversation with Bio Okamalafe and Sanali Kolhatkar. Our event will be moderated by Jasmine Verdi of Synergetic Press. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatishaloni peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. We'd like to take this moment to acknowledge those who have come before us as stewards of the land and offer an expression of respect. Tonight, as we find ourselves in a time of extreme ecological, social, and political crisis, we will reconsider our relationship to the planet and how we can build a regenerative future for all living beings. Mapping out visions of decolonial and environmental justice, we will explore the possibilities found in grassroots action and examine evidence-based solutions that can lead us to a sustainable forms of living and a more just world. Our participants tonight have spent their lives on the forefront of environmental activism and have developed visionary approaches towards a more sustainable future for all. We are greatly honored to have with us tonight Dr. Vandana Shiva. Her work is known worldwide. She is an author, physicist, ecologist, and advocate of biodiversity conservation and farmers' rights. Her pioneering work around food sovereignty, traditional agriculture, and women's rights has created fundamental cultural shifts in how the world views these issues. Dr. Shiva is a leader and board member of the International Forum on Globalization and a prominent figure of the global solidarity movement. Dr. Shiva founded Navdayana, an organization that promotes agroecology, seed freedom, and a vision of earth democracy. Dr. Shiva has received numerous awards and honors for her work. She is the subject of the award-winning uh, 2021 documentary, Seeds of Vandana Shiva. She has authored more than 20 books, including the recently published title, Agroecology and Regenerative Agriculture, Sustainable Solutions for Hunger, Poverty, and Climate Change. It is published by our friends at Synergetic Press. Joining her tonight is Bio Okamalafe. Bayo Okamalafe is a philosopher, writer, activist, and professor of psychology and executive director of the Emergence Network. In 2014, Professor Okamalafe was invited to be the special envoy of the International Alliance for Localization, a project of Ancient Futures USA. He has held a lecturing position at Covenant University, Nigeria, and has been a visiting professor at Middlebury College, Sonoma State University, Simon Fraser University, and Schumacher College, amongst others around the world. He currently teaches at Pacifica Graduate Institute, Yale, California, and also the University of Vermont in Burlington. Also joining us this evening is Sonali Kalhatkar. Uh, she is an award-winning journalist, activist, and artist. She's the founder and host and executive producer of Pacifica Radio's popular drive time program, Rising Up with Sonali, which airs on uh, KPFK and KPFA, and also has a TV show on Free Speech TV, a writing fellow with the Independent Media Institute, and formerly a weekly columnist at TruthDig. Ms. Kolhatkar is also the founding co-director of Afghan Women's Mission. In addition to her journalistic and political work, she is also an accomplished artist and has won numerous awards for her work. Uh, she is also the author of Bleeding Afghanistan, Washington Warlords and the Propaganda of Silence, published by Seven Stories Press. Her forthcoming book, Rising Up, The Power of Narratives in Pursuing Racial Justice, will be published by City Lights in the near future. Uh, she makes her home in California with her husband and two sons. And moderating our evening's discussion will be Jasmine Verdi, Jasmine Verdi is a freelance writer and editor. She works for Synergetic Press, organizing events, managing social media, and building community. Jasmine is also a writer for uh, Psych Psychedelics Today, the Chakruna Institute, Lucid News, amongst others. She is uh, currently pursuing an education working in psychedelic-assisted therapy, as well as being a great advocate for the therapeutic applications of psychoactive substances. Our partner in this evening's presentation is Synergetic Press. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge their good work. Synergetic Press is an independent publisher based in New Mexico. For over 35 years, their mission has been to promote mindful discussions around humanity's 
present and future lives. They have published unique and paradigm shifting books in subjects such as ecology, sustainability, psychedelics, consciousness, and cultural studies that both inspire individual and social change. City Lights has had the distinct pleasure of working with them over the years. We're delighted and honored to be working with them once again on this important evening. So please join us now in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Vandana Shiva, Bayo Okamalafe, and Sonali Kohatkar. I will turn things over now to Jasmine Verdi, who will moderate our evening. Yeah, thank you so much for that lovely, lovely introduction, Peter. I am so honored to be here moderating for, um, you know, three people that I find myself just humbled before. And um, yeah, my, my work has been really deeply inspired um, by each of you. So, um, but I, I have to pay special thanks to Vandana who really brings us all here this evening and um, maybe morning for some. I know that Bio is calling in from India and I know that Vandana is calling in from Germany and it's evening for me, I'm calling in from Mexico. So how beautiful that we can um, all be here together from um, such divergent time zones and um, distances. But um, I just wanted to introduce Bandana's books very quickly uh, that we've published. So Reclaiming the Commons about Biodiversity, Indigenous Knowledge and Biopiracy. Um, also more recently, Philanthropic Capitalism and the Erosion of Democracy about how philanthropic capitalists are kind of going into countries in the global south and um, yeah, under the guise of doing good, but usually has strings attached um, by way of um, power and control. And more recently, the book that Peter mentioned, um, Agroecology and Regenerative Agriculture. Um, this is a more solutions-based book. And um, yeah, for those wanting to enact change in a very practical way. And so when we thought of doing this conversation with Bandana, I had not long before read Bio's beautiful book, These Wilds Beyond Our Fences. And um, yeah, I, I just felt what a beautiful conversation that this could be between the two of you. And I've long followed Sonali's work. So um, I'm very grateful to be here with all of you. And um, yeah, just to contextualize my first question, um, I would love to, well, I would like to start this conversation just by acknowledging the, the dire need for change in our world. Um, one only has to look at our broken food system, our failing social systems, you know, an example, the, the recent court ruling that ended decades long protection for abortion in the US. Um, the inevitability of climate change, coronavirus, you know, the, the unfolding mass extinction event and um, so with many systems burning and crises running in parallel, many people, including myself, um, find themselves feeling disheartened. And more than that, paralyzed by hopelessness and grief at the sum of our collective and individual challenges. Um, and when I think about grief, I, I think about Joanna Macy's work that reconnects, which is based on collective grief work and um, you know, she kind of talks about grief as a catalyst for um, hope and positive transformation. And, um, you know, I see each of you as individuals who, um, you know, really embody this hope through your work. And so I'd like to open the question to all of you. Um, and I would very much like to know if there was a personal encounter with grief or existential pain that served to, to catalyze each of your journeys as change makers in this world. Um, what was that personal experience that jolted you into your current path? And maybe I will open this conversation, uh, well, this question up rather to Vandana first, then Bayo, then Sonali, but I'd really love to hear from all of you. Thank you, Jasmine. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. <clears throat> yes, it was a, a deep feeling of pain when I watched a forest that had been a familiar forest, an oak forest from which streams came, uh, disappear. I was going, leaving for Canada to do my doctoral studies. And I said, I'll carry a bit of the Himalayan treks with me, you know, because that's home, that's where I grew up. And uh, so I went for this trek and the forest was gone. And I went to swim in the stream and the water was only up to my ankles. And uh, that, you know, I really felt part of me had been chopped off. 
and when trying to catch the bus back from this little village, uh, I was sitting in the Chai Kadhabai, you know, in India where we have these little huts on the road where they serve the most beautiful chai. And I started to talk to the chai wala and talked about this pain. And he said, but now there's hope because Chipko has started. And the Chipko movement, as you know, was the movement of women saying, we're going to hunt the trees. You will have to kill us before you kill our trees. And uh, they came between the ax and the tree that was their life, their protection. Um, so I took a pledge. I, you know, I'll do my PhD, but every vacation, summer, winter, I'll come and volunteer for Chipko. And that became like my university of ecology. That's what put me into the path of understanding biodiversity, the poverty of monocultures. But then there were other moments of grief. In 1984, Punjab erupted in violence. That's when I've done my MSc honors in particle physics. And that pain of seeing a prosperous society have to kill, you know, 30,000 people were killed. And the Green Revolution was given a Nobel Peace Prize, Mr. Norman Borrow. And I said, here's a peace prize, but on the ground, there's bloodshed. It doesn't hang together. So I did work then on agriculture or the book, The Violence of the Green Revolution, because of the pain of not just the falsehood, you know, how can there be a propaganda? Oh my gosh, we were saved from famine. There was nothing like famine in 1965, 68 in India. But prosperous, hardworking farmers driven to this violence. And finally, you know, the grief of today's uh, robber barons saying, we've invented life, you know, we are the creators, uh, we will own the sea. And I think a large part of my work is driven by the grief that comes from limitless greed and the harm it's causing to the world and then mm. wanting to do something about it and, um, and finding creative solutions to cultivate hope. So we save seeds, seeds of hope, gardens of hope, we plant gardens of hope everywhere. And uh, you have to feed through compassion, the harm and the violation of the harm, and then distill it into the creative activities of creating a better world, a different world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's so moving to hear you speak about that. And um, yeah, I'd also like to turn the question to Bayo and Tanali, you know, about your experiences of grief. Good morning. Um, and thank you. And thank you, Vandana, for the um, ushering in with your story. Um, I'm still tender, actually. I'm still raw, being on the precipice of grieving for some weeks now. Um, I don't call her my mother-in-law, I just call her mommy. She died recently, a few days um, ago, um, or rather two weeks ago. Um, and we've been in rituals to guide her safely home. We, we just finished the ritual yesterday. So I, I'm, I'm literally still in a place of mourning. Um, but, but my adventures with, grieve, uh, with grief and grieving um, really started back home in Nigeria um, when my father passed away. <clears throat> and um, I remember us in this convoy of vehicles just driving into his village in mi uh, middle Nigeria and um, people were chasing the vehicles and screaming and crying and I never witnessed anything like that before. Um, market women, um, farmers were crying and I felt it was over the top. I felt it was too performative. I was like, um, daddy never knew any of these people. Why are they crying this way? You know, it was, I was this entirely Western trained, um, Western trained in my country, obviously, um, but Western trained kid that um, was conceptually and ontologically divorced from 
the ways that uh, my people saw the world. Um, it was later on that I got a sense of what was happening and how my people, the Yoruba people of Western Nigeria, ritualize grieving. Because to them, grieving is, um, grieving is not just something that happens to us. It is not a private event. It is a public event, right? It's not something that someone feels and then demonstrates. It is a calling, so to speak, much like the calling of the Igbo goddess from Eastern Nigeria, calling artists into the city or calling artists into the village square to create something new and unanticipated. Grieving is territorial, right? There was something about it that I was fascinated by learning later on in my seditious work as a, um, as a lecturer, as an academic, that really gripped me. First of all, I learned about the, um, the idea that grieving is the shriveling of the city subject or the citizen subject rather. Um, there's something about grieving that stops us in our tracks. And that is not quite amenable to the imperatives of progress, is it, <laughs> right? There's something about it that captures us and insists that we like, like seeds just wilt a little bit and dig ourselves into loamy places, if you will. And this idea of grieving as a more than human enterprise, as, a, as an ecological imperative um, is, is still at the heart of indigenous realities in my world and it's part of my practice and work today. And, and that dovetails and affects my notions of hopelessness and hope. Um, we have heard all the time that we should not give up hope. Um, Winston Churchill, um, his phrase comes to mind, never, ever, 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 ever give up. I can't remember how many times he said the ever, but he insisted that we never give up. And I think that is a motif that is written into modern um, civilization. It's the perpetuity and continuity of hoping. There's something colonial about that. Um, not to take hope in its totality, and I don't think there could ever be a totality of anything um, as colonial, but the ways that it shows up often um, reiterates human centrality. And I think there is a place where hopelessness is this call to stop is this call to cultivate new visions, new ways of seeing, new allies to participate with that are missing when we insist on going forward on our own power, right? Psychologists sometimes call it post-traumatic growth, right? But there is something about descending into the soil, descending to the earth, or what Yoruba people will call prostrating to the ground, the ballet, that allows new gods to make their voices known or allows new possibilities to be sensed or heard or envisioned. Um, so it's in the places of darkness that seeds grow. It's in the places of um, darkness that whale hunters create new songs in the uh, Katsiluni tradition of the Inuit people. It's in the places of darkness that we learn to become new. And I feel maybe my learnings about grieving even in the places of grieving that I am now, recollecting it um, or connecting it with, with my experience as a son losing his father at a very young age, and then connecting it with my own vocation to learn about the world in new ways. It feels that grieving is, and grief um, are, and have been hordes that the city has built ramparts to um, protect the citizen from. And if there's anything we need right now, it's, the, it's a break. It's a break of the citizen subject so that we can come out of this sensorial monoculture and see the world in new ways. Thank you so much, Bayo, especially for your vulnerability. And I, um, I send my love to you and your family. Um, you know, um, for your loss and 
Um, yeah, thank you so much for that beautiful, um, almost poetic um, expression. So I'd also like to ask um, Sonali about your personal encounter with grief and you know how, how that catalyzed your work. Um, yeah, um, it was actually a turning point in my life as, as I was listening to Vandana and Bio um, speak, it, it wasn't hard for me to pick out the most significant moment that changed the trajectory of what I do as meaningful work. And it happened more than 20 years ago. I was very young. I was in my early twenties. I was a um, scientist at Caltech. Um, and I was also an activist on the side and I came upon an email that was sent to me by some kind of a chain email type thing about what American feminists were calling gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Um, I was born and raised in a, in a Muslim country in, in the United Arab Emirates. And so I didn't leave that email. I, you know, I thought it was sort of anti-Muslim propaganda. Um, I did some digging around. I started reading about the Taliban. And I came across uh, the website of RAWA, the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan, which is the oldest feminist organization um, in Afghanistan. And the documenting that they had done of the violence that they experienced in this grindingly poor country. I'm from India, but Afghanistan's poverty is on a whole different level. And the world definitely had seemed to have forgotten that this was in 2000, actually it was in 1990 late 1999, early 2000, so before the September 11th attacks. Um, and I was stricken with a very deep sense of grief because it occurred to me that here are these women who are facing the most unimaginable level of oppression, whose nation had been turned into an entire prison and who had been discarded by the, 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 the world and they didn't have a choice but to survive. And so they were doing everything they could, risking their lives. They were smuggling video cameras under their burqas. They were publishing and smuggling magazines and books and documenting what was happening in their country as best as they could, subverting um, the power structure at huge risk to their lives. And they could have been you know, they, they were my sisters in a way. They looked like me. And here I was, this very privileged, well-educated young lady with all of this privilege and education at my fingertips. And I felt like I was wasting my life. And I remember feeling a very deep sense of grief and I cried. Um, I, I left my desk at Caltech and I just walked out of the office and I took a long walk to the coffee shop and I thought long and hard about what I wanted to do. And I can trace everything to that moment um, that happened after. And soon after I um, contacted Rawa, they wrote back, I ended up getting involved with them. I ended up helping to organize a speaking tour for them. I ended up um, starting a nonprofit with several other folks who were also moved by them, I, even though I knew not the first thing about running a nonprofit, And then when the September 11th attacks struck, I, I remember again, feeling grief for my sisters in Afghanistan who I knew would be the targets of the US NATO war rather than the Taliban. And, um, and suddenly everybody wanted to know about what was happening in Afghanistan, which then catapulted me into teach-ins and community events like this. And at one point, somebody suggested that I ought to consider a career in on the radio because KPFK, the local radio station there, could use someone like me um, who could articulate these sorts of political issues from there started. I, so I quit my job at Caltech, which was, you know, kind of a stupid thing to do, I think, in retrospect, but also probably the smartest thing I did without realizing that it was smart at the time because I had no idea where I was gonna land. Um, and it turned out that this was what I was meant to do. It turned out that journalism was what I was meant to do, asking those questions and pursuing something meaningful, pursuing something that would actually put my privilege to good use and, and start making a difference. Um, and that's it. At that point, I walked away from you know my life. I had multiple science degrees, none of which I'm directly using anymore. 
and I have no regrets. And I remember it was that moment of grief, you know, more than 20 years ago that really catapulted me into where I am today. And I'm very grateful for having felt that grief because when I was struck that deeply, so deeply that it changed the trajectory of my life, that was a that was evidence that I could feel and feel so deeply that I had to act. And therefore grief can be a catalyst for change. Um, it, you know, it can be as cliche as it may sound, it can be that um, momentum to urge uh, individuals or community to rise out of the ashes of grief and find rebirth and renewal um, and, and a better direction. So yeah, that's my story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I think it's such an important topic to, to traverse right now, especially you know, collectively, there's so much grief in the world for all that we're going through. And um, yeah, okay, for my next question, I, I'd just like to draw on the, the, the theme that I touched upon in the earlier question, which is the destruction unfolding in our world. And, um, you know, I draw upon the, the Native American concept of Wetico or Windigo to understand the mind virus that has long blinded us collectively from, you know, waking up to our ecocidal tendencies. And, um, you know, Personally, I think many people, and I, I have the impression that people around me also, you know, believe that uh, people are waking up to this senselessness um, inherent in our systems, finally, and feeling imparent, well, feeling impelled to take action in some way to help to the best of their abilities, as you know, you've each illustrated through your, through your sharing. And, um, but, I, but I think it's hard to know where to start. And um, I know that one of your most well-known sayings, Bio, is these times are urgent, let us slow down, and that you have a particular philosophy named post-activism, which I would love to, to hear you speak more to in a minute. But comparatively, when I engage with um, Vandana's work, there is a like apparent in some of her writings um, this sense of urgency to, to take action and um, there is a perhaps, you know, between the two of your, um, you know, philosophies and work, maybe there is a, um, a tension or a perceived tension between the act of slowing down versus the act of kind of, you know, enacting practical, tangible solutions. And um, I would love to hear the two of you, Vandana and Biolog, uh, sorry, Bio Dialogue. <laughs> To the, to the tension, um, you know, inherent between the sense of urgency and the need to slow down. So maybe just briefly, Bio, if you could um, speak to post-activism and your view on the need to slow down, and I would love to just hear Vandana's thoughts on, you know, also the tension between um, the urgency to act um, versus slowing down. Thank you. I remember the first time I, uh... I shared in a, in, a, in a talk speech in Johannesburg. He said, uh, the times are urgent, let us slow down. And there were some German brothers of mine in the congregation. And I remember this uh, dear brother of mine really captured by that saying that he told himself and he wrote it in his journal, I guess, that he was going to slow down. So he, got up from his uh, space and he got to work and tried to slow down. And I got to know this because he wrote to me eventually and said, um, this isn't working. This slowing down business isn't working because I'm trying to do everything slowly. I'm trying to type my memos slowly and I'm trying to uh, open the laptop slowly, but it isn't working. So can you tell me how this works? And I wrote back to him and said, slowing down is not a, func a function of speed, right? It's not slowing down speed. It's noticing that we're not the only ones in the room. So it's a function of awareness, if you will. Um, and awareness in form of this. Um, as a kid, I grew up understanding that the highway wasn't the only form of agency, right? Um, that we were poised 
as beings in crossroads. And we were indebted to these crossroads. And these crossroads are monstrous traffickings. They're ecological events, they're archetypal events, they're spiritual undertakings, they're microbial activisms. There's no way to divorce ourselves from the goings on in the world at large. Um, of course, the imperative of the mother subject is to try to take desire and agency and um, push it through the way of the individual. But the idea of the crossroad is that we are always indebted to things that are greater than us, right? Um, but it is very difficult in times of deep desensitization to notice these others around us. So a break comes through, a crack in the fabric of reality, a virus steals into the economy. It steals into our ways of thinking. It disturbs our ideas of the future. Suddenly, you know, next week isn't as confident as it once was, right? A pandemic spoils everything. So something cracks open the chalice and then we're being invited to stay in that crack. That is the invitation of slowing down. Urgency becomes a diffracted immediacy. Instead of just unbothered continuity, it is an invitation to notice, right? The others around us that have always been part of our doings and goings on. And, you know, if we were to just patch, patch up the wound and continue as usual, getting back to normal, then we stand the risk of repeating the troubles, the suffering, the evils of our time. It's like putting solar panels on a slave ship, right? <laughs> we don't wanna do that. We don't want an equal piece of a carcinogenic pie. We want to find other ways of addressing the hidden curriculums and imperatives of this moment. That is what post-activism means. It is not a repudiation of activism, it is not a way of saying we shouldn't act now. It is a question, who are we acting with? Who have we always been in action with? And what does it mean to act in a time when the very notion of agency and the individual is not possible anymore, is not sustainable? We are in fact assemblages and we must act as assemblages. Um, yeah, that's one bit of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And um, just turning it over to Bandana, I'm just curious, you know, since Bio has unpacked his, you know, notion of post-activism. I haven't fully you, unpacked it. I, 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 I know. I haven't I fully unpacked it. I know. It's worth many, many books. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear Bandana speak to the perceived yeah. tension between. Well, I don't see a tension. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, s slow food, I mean, part of that movement, yeah. slow clothing, not accepting uh, the crazy idea that uh, clothes are to be worn one time and then thrown away uh, just so they can be obsolescence built into the fast fashion economy. Um, Slowing down is not about activism alone. Slowing mm. down is about how you live. Mm -hmm. You live slow, of course, conscious of your being an interbeing, conscious yeah. of every impact on every other being that your actions will make. Worse is a carelessness. Because you've defined others don't matter. First of all, they're not beings, they're objects. They are your property, you know. I see a big part of, you know, I, I wrote a book called Biopiracy. And I tried to, in that book, make a parallel between what was happening to the seed and genetic engineering right. and intellectual property and this idea of property yeah. in a fetus by declaring the woman's body as terra nullish, you know, she's just a container, she's empty. Yeah. And all of this fragmented tearing down partly comes from the mechanistic reductionism, but it also comes from the fact that there is an issue of speed. You know, what did fossil fuels give us? Have fossil fuels given us any quality of life? Have fossil fuels given us any enrichment of our relationships? No, they gave us speed, yeah? The spinning wheel spun slowly. The mills in England 
with driven with fossil fuels were all based on speed. My country's biggest, for me, the current pain is the chopping down some of the most beautiful forests, including those we protected, for driving faster by half an hour, you know? Railways being brought all over the world, always about speed, you know, half an hour faster. And that half an hour faster is basically saying, ecosystems don't matter, biodiversity doesn't matter, life doesn't matter that automobile moving faster is the indicator. Mm -hmm. And slowing down then means all the relationships, but also the quality of life, yeah? yeah. Uh, and I guess that's what you mean about, you know, against activism, you know, uh, being, you know, when I went to do, do my PhD in Canada, I couldn't believe how all my fellow uh, university uh, companions would run away over the weekend. I said, why do you run away? You know, why can't you be where you are? Why can't you have peace and place? And uh, an urgency is not about time. Mm -hmm. Urgency is about the imperative of the needing to change to, you know, the etymological root, the Latin root is to compel, to stimulate, to press, you know, for change. Mm -hmm. About the imperative, it's urgency is about grief at a very high level, mm -hmm. yeah? Whereas mm -hmm. slowing down is about the action of not causing the harm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they go together, actually. I, I, I think so. I, I, don't, I, I don't see, um, I, I, I mean, we, what we're doing is reading together these um, readings um, of, slowness and urgency and the imperatives of this moment. How, basically, how do we act? How do we become more responsible to these times? How do we address um, uh, the Anthropocene? How do we address climate chaos? How do we address the, the invisibilization of uh, female bodies? How do, we, how do we address these moments? And I guess the, the, this hidden, this animist or post-humanist or more than human imperative, this slowness, which might seem counterintuitive at first, is, the, is really an invitation to become different, right? It's to become other, to find other ways of seeing and being and becoming that does not reiterate the problem. And this is the reason why I feel that the first tenet of post-activism is sometimes the way we see the problem and the way we act in the problem is part of the problem. The way we address the problem is the problem. And that calls for something different. That calls for a break, right? We need a break actually. And I, I'm not speaking about taking a vacation or doing yoga more frequently. I'm talking about something more profound. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Mm. Yeah, thank you both so much. And I, I really love this distinction between, you know, urgency um, as a need versus something time-based. And um, I, I agree that we need to kind of break away from these failing paradigms and, um, you know, start anew um, in a more grounded and, um, yeah, grounded and humble way. Um, and I'd also like to direct a, a question to Sonali, um, in particular, um, relating to your work as a journalist. Um, you know, all of you actually are communicators of crucial messages, but I, I wonder how you perceive, Sonali, the, the collective dialogue around today's challenges and what communicators could do to language the crises of our times more effectively. Um, as you put it beautifully in one of your talks, um, the role of a journalist is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Which is not something that I invented. I borrowed that. Okay. I don't know who <laughs> said that, but it's it's a it's a common saying. And and I think uh, you know I'm I'm writing this book right now about narrative and about how intentional storytelling is a necessary, not ne not just precursor, but an ongoing project to change that when we tell our stories and it matters who's telling the stories and we tell them with intention. We lay the groundwork for shifting priorities and perceptions that lead to 
long-term policy change. And so when I write as a journalist, say about economic justice, I'm very careful not to internalize the assumptions of say the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times who uh, make the assumption because they're so blind to it that it's just utterly invisible that a market-based economy is natural, right? They internalize the assumptions about capitalism, about a growth mindset, that economic growth is, if it's good for Wall Street, it's good for the planet. These are internalized assumptions that inform their journalism. And so I'm always thinking about that. And if we change the standards by which we, you know, by, by, by standards of our values, then we start to think very, very differently. So as a journalist, for example, I'm always thinking about well, how are the people who are the most vulnerable in this story reacting? And how can I write the story from the perspective of their well-being or the well-being of the planet or the well-being of the e ecosystem within which the people and, and, and the planet um, are functioning in that moment? How do I tell the story of the infant formula shortage from the perspective of people trying to get infant formula in a world where three companies own the majority of the production of baby formula, right? Um, food monopolies, which Vandana has been writing about for many, many years, which, um, you know, organizations like Food and Water Watch have been calling attention to for many, many years are not something that our corporate journalists and corporate media think about. Maybe now they might think about it, but so how we use language is so critical, upending notions of, of, of what's considered benign and noble just because they are graphs on the pages of the Wall Street Journal showing stock prices going up. But as stock prices go up and the billionaires' wealth skyrockets, our wages remain suppressed. And so I think there is this really remarkable shifting, cultural shifting that we're seeing all around us, not just with the rise of unions in the United States, a country that has for decades now had such uh, dismal levels of unionization. We're now seeing that change. I think that is going hand in hand with particularly young people who have graduated with huge debt and poor job prospects, realizing that capitalism has not worked for the planet and it's not working for them. Um, and are realizing the value of, as Bio was saying, slowing down, the value of leisure. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, the sort of individual mindset driven. Um, businesses that, uh, that, that, that capitalize on everything possible have created these industries around self-care that completely miss the point because self-care isn't about the individual. It's really a collective action that we take to slow down, to reduce work. And there's some really amazing radical notions around anti-work or a universal basic income where we just pay people to like live, exist and be happy. Um, and so there is a cultural shift happening and journalists play a big role in that, in the language that we use with how we frame stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate you, you know, talking about framing these stories from perspectives that are otherwise marginalized. Um, and I think that brings me, you know, perfectly to my next question. I'm kind of aware of time. I think we have about like 20 minutes or so left, um, but, you know, um, so this panel is called Decolonial Futures and Environmental Justice, and I'm particularly excited about tapping into the decolonial dimension of this conversation. Um, but, you know, I'd also like to point out something both special, uh, perhaps rare, and the fact that all four of us on this panel are somehow, you know, in some way connected to India. And I think that's really special. Um, you know, I'm half Indian and, um, yeah, my, my personal ancestry is kind of deeply entangled with the history of the British Empire. Um, you know, my, my great grandfather um, went to um, East Africa from Punjab and he was working to build the, the Uganda-Kenya railway. And uh, my, my grandmother was born in, in Mombasa and then 
um, my, my dad was born in East Africa. So um, they eventually moved to the UK. And even the more European side of my family is kind of entangled with colonialism through, I was, I'm, I'm also Cypriot and Cyprus was once a British colony. And, you know, that the British also played a, a role in dividing the island into two parts. And so, um, yeah, I, I feel that, you know, I'm, I'm actively taking up a, a path of decolonization in my own life, um, where, whether it comes to, you know, advocating for racial justice or, um, you know, just being merely mindful of the ontologies and epistemologies which I, um, which I ingest and embody. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious to hear, maybe I'll pass it to you, Vandana, but, um, you know, how your work seeks to address some of these injustices of colonialism and how, how you embody that decoloniality. Um, and the weight that you give it in creating regenerative futures. And if we have time, I'd love to hear from Bio and Sonali, but we'll, we'll see. Um, I think the current uh, emergencies we face are really a consequence of this crazy historic break where a crisis-ridden Europe wanted to escape to other lands, just like the big tech giants want to escape to Mars. Um, but it was for the resources and it was for the labor and it was for the markets. It was all part of one piece. Very well thought out. Cecil Rhodes has, uh, Rhodes has written about it. Uh, colonialism then created all kinds of false realities. Yeah. Racial divides. But to me, the more serious is taking the commons because everything that sustains life, because it is about relationships, relationships can't be chopped up and said, this is mine and this is yours. Relationships are interbeing and therefore they are the connectors. Therefore they create the commons and care for the commons. You know, I think the last question on slowing down, I would say slowing down is about bringing care at the heart and escaping from the carelessness that colonialism creates because it is a careless instrument of brutality to the land, to the people, the biodiversity and the cultures. The very idea of calling us barbarians and primitive is, is part of that, you know, and um, in one stroke of a pen, I think it was 1789, Lord Cornwallis just writes and says, the land and soil of India belongs to the British. And then they started to collect rents from the peasants. It is called Lagan, this very famous American film called Lagan. And this is what led to poverty, a transfer of 45 trillion from India to England, made in England rich, but left 40 to 50, 60 million famine deaths in India. The very people growing food were dying because they were paying rents and taxes. And in a way, the same is happening today. Half of the hungry of the world are producers of agriculture. But that agriculture produce is a commodity. It's going for biofuel, it's going for animal feed, it's not nourishing people. So for me, decolonialism and decolonization is taking the fictions. My book, Oneness One versus One Percent, is about all the constructs that were made real and all the reals that were made to disappear. That's a decolonization. Mm -hmm. A, that we are related to other beings. That to me, and that's the idea of Earth democracy. This is the heart of decolonization. The inequality created on the basis of the color of your skin. How superficial can that be? That the brutality of a slavery of owning people and shipping them across the Atlantic. <coughs> but that gets carried on with the seed. Yeah, exactly like land was taken over and turned into private property to collect rents, an attempt was made to take over seed and collect private property. And my, what my life's trajectory has been shaped very much by saving seeds, exchanging seeds, creating community seed banks, and not allowing the fiction that seed is an invention of the poison makers, you know? <laughs> and I, I have resisted that colonization with literally the last four decades of my life. But I think something, this colonization is now, particularly now, this is, is where it's going. 
we are being, you know, uh, with the seed issue, they were mining for genes, you know, and then genetically modifying to sell a patented product. But taking what is full, whole, real, living, interconnected, and turning it into raw material to be mined is now happening with us as human beings. So for me, decolonization is about not just reclaiming our humanity, but reclaiming our humanity and the interconnectedness with the rest of the world. So during the COVID, I mean, March was the peak of COVID 2020, Microsoft gets a patent, 060606. Unbelievable patent. We are users of machines and the machines take the data from us, mine our data, through algorithms, evaluate our value on the basis of how we are reacting. And then allocate our value, not as earth beings equal to all other beings, human beings equal to all other beings, but unequal beings, no more beings, users, allocated cryptocurrency. And that, these are radical shifts. And you know, people who've designed all this by 2030, they want a world where life disappears, ability to take care of yourself disappears. You have to live literally, pay rent to live. And that's the crisis of housing in my view. That's the crisis of unemployment. That's the crisis we see all over. And decolonization for me is then to realize earth is living, we are part of the earth. We are, you know, we have to reclaim our kinship with the earth. And out of that comes all the possibilities of providing and provisioning in the commons. And that's why Gandhi said, you know, the earth has enough for everyone's needs, not for a few people's greed. I think the polarization and inequality where 10 men own half the wealth of the world, and then they have natural asset companies that then own all the corporations. And now <laughs> there's an attempt to create natural asset companies, natural asset companies. Nature is an asset on Wall Street. Last year, September, they worked it out, Rockefeller and New York Stock Exchange. We can make 4,000 trillion by taking over all the land, all the water, all the forests, all the biodiversity. So reclaiming the commons to me is the ultimate decolonization and absolutely refusing to have these lines put through what connects us. We will not be broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's absolutely imperative. And just listening to you speak, you know, my, my hairs stand up and my rage fires up. And I just feel like, you know, um, yeah, saying no to all of these, these impositions which have been placed upon our society for so long. Um, yeah, maybe I will ask Bio and Sonali to briefly share their reflections on the subject and then we can turn it over to about 10 minutes or so of questions from the audience. Um, I, I was just briefly reveling in the fact that I'm probably, by mere fact that I'm in India now, and Vandana and Sonali are outside of India, that I'm probably more Indian than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, there, is, there is a sense of decoloniality that it animates my work. Um, and, and maybe I could best share that in a story. In 1803, um, 75, according to record, 75 Igbo men, women, and children were stolen from Eastern Nigeria and taken across the Atlantic on board the slave ship called the Wanderer to the state of Georgia. Um, just before they arrived, there was something wrong with the weather or maybe something right, because it allowed the people stolen um, to mount an insurgency, mutiny. And they stole uh, control of the slave ship and they chased, um, they pulled the ship to Dunbar Creek in Georgia and chased away their captors. Their captors ran inland, brought reinforcements and um, they were about to capture or recapture these 75 people, um, but they refused to be captured. They refused to give their bodies to the labor of the slave plantation. And so what did they do? They marched in a single file 
into the waters, singing a song to Ahmad Yoha, right? That the spirit that brought us across the Atlantic would take us back home. And they marched in a single file into the waters. Now, some observers wrote in a very, very colonial fashion, they drowned. And I think that is a tiny, <laughs> a very shriveled um, encapsulation of what happened. Other rumors suggest that they turned into birds and they flew back. I tend to lean on the side of those rumors <laughs> because of the speculative, poetic, archetypal ideas um, or sensibilities that are alive in the world. Um, but one more, one more account that might help um, bring this home. In 1897, um, British, a British force came to capture the Oba of Benin. Now Benin, many people have not, may not have heard of, we all have heard of Wakanda, but before Wakanda, there was Benin and Benin was a city with walls and streetlights long before it was available in the West. Um, these British forces came, shackled the king, imprisoned and incarcerated people, burned the city down and um, took what is now called the Benin bronzes, right? Artifacts from the palace and stole it and took it across the, um, to Europe and across the Atlantic. Those sacred artifacts are now um, domiciled in and the Louvre in Paris, in Humboldt, you know, in museums across the world, in New York, in Europe, everywhere. Um, in 2020, however, um, The Economist released an article called, um, I think it was titled this way, that is the British Museum being haunted? And it is a very fascinating account. I would encourage everyone to just find out. It's available for free on the internet. Turns out what was happening is that those Benin bronzes are causing trouble <laughs> in the British museums, in museums across the world, especially the British Museum. Um, some guards will close up for the day in, in a museum and they will find out that the places where they're holding those bronzes or those artifacts, those sacred artifacts, things will start going wrong. The light will go off, the doors will fling open. There would be electrical surges of some kind. And I'm not talking about woo woo stuff. I'm talking about it came out in the Economist for crying out loud. It was, it was important enough to be reported in Economist. And maybe this is my idea that when I think of decoloniality, I think of it as refusal the refusal, not just of bodies to be captured by the imperatives of the plantation. I think of it as the refusal of nature. You know, when Vandana Shiva speaks about um, reclaiming the commons, it's also noticing that nature is agential. It will not be put in the family way, right? Even artifacts that are supposed to be designated objects, right? resist their objectivity and they, <laughs> and they become subjects in their own right. And you're doing things, you're doing things in the museums and everybody's like, what do we do? It actually drove one of the descendants of the soldiers of that force in 1897 to come back to Nigeria and return the object and say, you know, basically say, we don't want this anymore. <laughs> this is what's happening. So nature is not still, that's the idea. Nature is not, an object. Nature is not at the end of our benevolence. Nature is powerful and agential. Nature is thinking. Thought is not in human brains. Thought is in the anima mundi, right? It's in the world at large, right? And maybe that's decoloniality. I think of blackness not as just this identitarian concept, but as refusal. It is as the disarrangement of design. When something ruptures the familiar, and something else sprouts from that. And I think that is the imperative of our time to notice the places where something else is springing from, the places of failure, the places of, of you know, seditious, mutinous openings. And it is only by surrounding those cracks as if they were classrooms that we might find other places of power with the world. 
Beautiful. Yeah, I love I love the uh, the archetype of the the trickster in those bronze artifacts, and you know how that they, they like you said they they defy objectification. Um, yeah, um, I, I also have been spending you know time with certain indigenous groups recently, and you know I think there's something very similar that um, is there, leaving these offerings to the earth, and the offerings are in act of intentionality and that intentionality is somehow infused with those objects um, and they have their own um, like you said agency um, okay so I'd, I'd love to open up to Sonali and then we can round up with two questions from the audience um, I mean I for me I think it's really important when we look at how to get ourselves out of the mess that we're in on a planetary level that we don't just bring in indigenous leaders as like consultants or even collaborators, but really as leaders. And I think that that's so important. And it's actually, it's happening on small scales in, in the United States right now. Um, you know, I've, I've been documenting and reading about and learning about um, efforts in Northern California where we've had tremendous wildfire damage and an understanding, a slow but steady understanding that the, the damage to the planet from things that have been seen as destructive, that damage actually originates from the systems, not from fire. <laughs> the systems that have allowed fire to become out of control and wild um, and that indigenous wisdom understood so much earlier than our current economic systems, how to tame the fire and not just how to control it, in fact, not to control it, but to really work with it. And so there are um, practitioners of tr traditional ecological knowledge to EK here in the United States, um, whose work I've just been so, impressed by and amazed by and they're working in collaboration with city governments but I really think we need to start turning over land to the stewardship of indigenous communities to heal what has been hurt um, and you know not to just say that we want to learn from them or market what they have to teach us but seed ownership which I think is a very radical act. And I, I, even ownership isn't the right word because most indigenous communities don't, um, I don't um, agree with the idea of ownership because it was property ownership in the first place that formed the basis of our current colonial um, and capitalistic ventures, but stewardship, partnership with the land um, and whatever we can learn from some of these traditions, some of these wisdoms, and however much we can cede to their leadership, um, that's, I think, where the hope lies. That's where decolonialism, decolonization um, really, I think, should begin. And, you know, it's going to look different in different lands. It's going to look different in different countries. Um, but it really needs to, to happen yesterday um, in order for us to have any hope of salvaging the planet, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you you speak to this kind of yeah more practical part of reparation. Um, and it's so important. Um, yeah, I I'm aware of time, and I could go on speaking with all of you all all evening long. And um, I just want to thank you all so much. I'm I'm going to pass it back to Peter, who's going to field a couple of questions from the audience. And um, yeah, again, my deepest deepest thank yous. So we have. Um... A question from Nina, what can a decolonized education for the next generation look like? Whoever would like to take that. Yeah. Um, well, if one of the uh, divisions of, uh, of colonialism was what I call ecological apartheid, it pretends that we are separate from nature and we are our masters then decolonize education is recognizing that the earth is living and learning from nature, listening to nature in her diversity, <clears throat> learning from indigenous cultures who never saw themselves as separate. And uh, 
and you know we are at a watershed because um, on the one hand you know people like mr gates wants to have no schools no teachers you know it means zero cost education zero cost, you know for him everything is about profits alone <clears throat> I think a decolonized education has to be the fullness of our relationships with other beings. That, and that education means the doing, it means the living, and it means the learning. Mm. Uh, I, Anybody I, else like I, to take that? Yeah, I would. I would like to piggyback on Nana's comments um, about listening. Um, so everyone who knows me know that my wife and I are unschooling our kids. It's a misnomer, actually. We're unschooling ourselves. They've never been to school, but we perform a kind of um, grounded, emergent, self-directed education that is about listening, treating our children eight and five. This Today is my son's birthday um, as yeah. philosophers in their own right right? That, that they didn't come into the world, they came out of the world. I remember one day, um, Alethea going, coming out, and I, I presume I'm not speaking to ladies and gentlemen, so I'm just going to speak, speak it, say it exactly how she asked it, this question. She went into the toilet and came out, and she said, Dada, where does shit go? <laughs> and, and, and I said, that's, you know, that's an important question. How about we research this? And so we took our, our, our books and our pens, and then we hit the streets, just engaging people in some self-styled research inquiry, which is no less research than anything any university can perform. You know? And we performed this fugitive study with people, inviting questions and um, gestures of surprise. And we created our own um, tracing of a response to that question. Maybe my point is this, there's nothing more scandalous to the modern subject and to the monocultures that we inhabit than noticing that we are not as static or as totalized or as isolated as the city believes us to be. Um, in this sense, our bodies do not precede movement. You know, bodies are the movements that they make. But the citizen subject is coddled into this pixelated, you know, pixelated box that whispers to us that this is what you are. Your identity is shriveled. You are this and you are nothing else. Decoloniality is about tracing our large bodies. It's about following hidden traces of our tentacles. It's about becoming monster. Right, this is what listening is to me, is listening to shit. It's listening to farts. It's listening to failure. It's listening to what the world is becoming, right? And I think we need this kind of inquiry, this sensorial diffractivity in our times. We need to spill open because being coddled as we are is leading to nowhere good. The highway is not leading to anywhere interesting any longer. So we need to go into the fugitive edges and become monsters. Tanali, do you have any comments? I mean, uh, you know, education is under attack here in the United States. Uh, the part, the kinds of education that are under attack are the ones that are most effective at getting people to question um, the myths of manifest destiny and the origins of this nation and the institutions of slavery. Um, and the reason why they are under attack is because they they help open the minds of young people and lead them to question. Um, and, you know, we absolutely need to to, to protect those forms of education. That's where a lot of narrative setting happens. Uh, young people internalize their views of the world um, in school and uh, they are through their education and, and how that's presented to them and how they learn to lead inquiry absolutely matters um, in terms of the kinds of citizens they grow up to be, the citizens of the planet that they grow up to be. So we must protect critical education, the kind of education that promotes critical inquiry at all costs. I have a question from Luis. 
uh, for Vandana and Bio. Um, how do you see new paradigms for human progress start to work? Is this a macro or micro initiation? Well, I think the idea of human progress is the problem. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, as Tagore so beautifully said, you know, if you can ask of a train, how, how well did you progress from station A to station B? But you don't ask of a tree, how did you progress? You ask of a tree how it flourished in the same place, it, you know. So this imposition of, of mobility, you know, as our identity is the colonial concept that we have to shed our inter interactions and being and meanings and histories and cultures in order to progress towards what the colonizer wants us to go to. I've called it chrono colonization. You know, you use time to say you are my, my past and I will shape your future. That's what's so wrong about the idea of human progress. Earth being, you know, where we become kin with all other beings and within all the slowing that those relationships create, live a full life of meaning, satisfaction, joy, happiness. That is what we are seeking. I mean, and that's why, you know, we. Uh, I noticed by you, you've taught at Schumacher College. Well, you know, we, Satish made me start a Schumacher College in India. It's called the Earth University, where literally the living <laughs> earth is your teacher. The seed is your teacher. The peasants are your teacher. The soil organisms are your teacher. And, yeah. and basically, we've got to realize that we are all the others. <laughs> you know, they shape us. They make us. And they sustain right. us. And this, you know, the colonizers claiming to be the support of that which they are crushing is the tendency we have to go out of. Hmm. Um, yes. Uh, I'm very interested in what, Vandana, you called it chrono, what did you call it? Chrono? Chrono colonization, using time colonization. to say you, you are the past. Our present is constantly right. made the past. Our potential right. futures are always made. I, mean, I get this attack all the time from my friends in Monsanto Bayer, you know. Oh, that's past agriculture. Well, right. your destructive systems are not the future of agriculture. Yeah. So chrono colonization is making a line and saying, you are down here. My friend Ashish Nandi called it the inclined plane. And we are up here. Uh -huh. And you have to aim towards this. Fem women must aim towards the most violent caricature of masculinity. And, right. you know, it's constantly this push when all we need is, as you said, plurality of parts, yeah? And the plurality of parts have many, many crossings. And, uh, and you know, the present, the past, the present, the future is all one continuum of space and time, not time alone. I think the fragmenting of time from space is part of the ecological rupture of this planet. Right. So bringing time back into its mold of space and time as a continuum, we call it Desh Kal in India, Mm. That is the belonging, that's the being, that then is the interactions. So mm. just, just, you know, uh, to me at this point where extinction is the predictable outcome of the current project of colonization, mm. resisting extinction and staying alive is the revolution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Vandana. Um, I find that really interesting because I have a related concept. I call it chrono-feminism. And it is this notion that time isn't this linear thing. If anyone here has read Chinua Achebe's The Arrow of mm -hmm. God, or oh, things fall apart, you, you might be aware that um, time, isn't, time isn't straightforward. Time is slushy. Um, the past is yet to come, so to speak. And so chronofeminism is the understanding that there are seditious puddles of time and temporality and that we do not exist in time, so to speak. We are temporality secreting bodies along with the ecologies that we're in. So the, colo uh, the colonizing ethic or the notion that progress is this rational, supra-rational archetypal or objective realization of time as it really is, is already a lie, right? And is already a myth-making machine that is leading or is producing the Anthropocene. So I do not think or favor notions of human progress. 
I more favor um, understandings of descending, right? Descending into the soil, descending into the earth, just like um, uh, 40, was it 45,000 years ago or 48,000 years ago, some scientists in New Zealand discovered that, um, that there was this rupture in, in, in the atmosphere and it drove proto-human populations into the earth to create what we now know as cave art, right? In a sense, we are in a time where we need to go under, to become hypo-subjects, in the words of Timothy Morton, to become, um, to become practicing beings that know how to speak the names of seeds, to know how to speak the names of trees and rivers and stones, that know how to listen to the world in animistic ways. And until we do that, we will continue to reiterate and reproduce um, understandings of progress that will lead us to the precipice from which there is no return. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I have to take a deep breath after those two answers. Uh, there is so much there. Um, I, I think we could have a whole other discussion just going down this road, but we have time for maybe one more question. And um, Jocelyn asks, I think this is probably a good way to end it. How can we revitalize plant seeds in people's spirits in an era of trauma bombing, hypervigilance, and desensitization? You know, my understanding after all these years of doing and knowledge flowing out of the doing is that we don't plant seeds to change other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every seed we plant is our own evolution. But because we are interconnected, because there's non -lo quantum non-locality, quantum coherence in the world, each of our actions triggers changes in other places and other people in other beings. Um, so I think we, for too long, there's been, at least in the West, the idea that you've got to change others, you know? And that is how change is made. And that's why I so respect Gandhi who said, you have to be the change you want to see. But in an interconnected world, that is not an isolated act. It is a trigger for change in any way in, in terms of new energy levels being created, new hope being created. And, and you know, with really staring, staring, you know, disasters are not about the future anymore. They used to say climate havoc will be a hundred year later, life and death. It's life and death today. Water crisis, mm -hmm. life and death today. Not having access to food, life and death today. Getting sick because of bad food in the best of countries, life and death today. You know, most people, more people are dying of chronic diseases because of bad food than for lack of food. You know, three billion <laughs> have chronic diseases, billion now without food. So I think Reinhabiting our living world and reestablishing our kinship. That really is the work. And the, the main thing is if the earth is living, we have to do very little. She does a lot. We have to do the right action of service and going back to the soil. And we offer a course called Return to the Soil, Return to the Earth in October, which is the practice of healing the living seed, the living soil, the living food, the living economy, and a living future. Uh, it's an exciting moment because the basic issues of living have come back to center stage. They were, progress has put them to the sidelines. Mm -hmm. yeah? And <clears throat> living has come back in a time of extinction. The most important activity is living. So Nali? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, can you repeat the question again? I, I'm, I was, I'm thinking yeah. about what Vandana said. I know. Um, <laughs> so Jocelyn asked, how can we revitalize plant seeds in people's spirits in an era of trauma right, bombing, right, right. hypervigilance and desensitization? Right. I mean, I, 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 there's not much I can say beyond what Vandana is saying. It, it's gotten me to, you know, I've been thinking a lot about intentional the storytelling and 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 changing the way we think about um, our relationship with one another and whether it's through mass media or through individual action and, and one of the things that I have been thinking more about is how we 
talk to one another as individuals and how in order to do that, we really have to stop trying to change one another and start listening to one another. And I know that sounds a little woo woo and I am sort of not really there yet myself in terms of being able to do that. Uh, but I think real maturity will come when we, for, for me as an individual, when I can truly genuinely start um, being able to ask questions of somebody that I deeply disagree with and find a way to come to a common understanding with them about what truly matters because we have to have faith that our fellow humans care about humanity as much as we do. If, if we can't come to that common understanding, we operate on the assumption that some of us care more than others and I, I can't, bring myself to accept that. So I don't know if that's hopeless or naive, I'm sorry, ho too hopeful or, or too naive, but um, children think like that, right? Children have those approaches to the world. Um, and then as we grow, we build our armor around us and our self-righteousness. And, and I'm trying to think about breaking some of that armor down and how to do that in, in ways to, to seed hope, if you will, to seed that spark in one another. Bio? Thank you. Um, um, sorry, I'd like to just refer to, like jumping here from here to there in history or across history. Um, in 1903, the Herero and Namakwa peoples of Namibia were, were killed by German forces um, and um, just two years ago, um, the German government offered 1 billion euros as compensation for this great loss. Um, I know my African people, they chuckled like, <laughs> you're right, that's not enough. We need 1 trillion though. Um, but the, the, the figure had nothing to do with what they were requesting. What they were after was something more than just what can be offered as justice by this modern framework, right? It's the same idea that um, in climate related discourses that we can save the ocean by giving it a dollar amount, right? So what, what's the dollar amount? It's $1 trillion, right? It's still within the framework of and the epistemology of settlement, right? Um, and, and maybe in response to that question by my sibling, it would be to notice the places of failure, the places where things do not add up, where the algorithms and the arithmetic, uh, uh, arithmetic of, of settlement do not provide or produce the kinds of results we're looking for, where our bodies want to do something different, right? That is, those are the places of failure that we want to cultivate and tend to and notice. So where we fail as citizen subjects, where our sensibilities are asking different questions, where we want to scream uh, while the city just wants us to be productive citizens of the rat race, where we want to scream and ask new questions and query the gods that protect modern civilization. Those are the sites of new power. Those are the sites of new sensibilities. Those are the fugitive places of the otherwise that we're seeking. So I would say, tend to your wounds or share them. Um, don't pursue a politics of the cure, right? Which is supported and generated and produced by notions of safety that is endemic in civilization today. Just like the slave ship provided nettings to protect the slaves, right? <laughs> so that they wouldn't kill themselves, right? Um, we need something different. We need to jump out of the slave ship. We need to undercut these um, vast systems of oppression. And the way we do that is to trace what the wound is inviting us to do. Yeah, let me just end there because I'm losing my voice at this moment. <laughs> well, this has been <clears throat> such a rich discussion. Uh, Jasmine, since you've been moderating, was there anything you wanted to say? I mean, I, I'm just leaving this space feeling so enriched and, and um, humbled, honored, um, in awe. And I, I just want to say thank you, really. Um, 
it's so beautiful to get the, the diversity of each of, of your perspectives and see how they interweave with each other so beautifully. And um, I'm just very grateful. And there's so and, much. Uh, is Please. And I was just going to say, for those of you interested in exploring Vandana's work and bios, like, please do not hesitate to check out our beautiful, beautiful books. Um, so I'll, I'll leave with that. And as we wind this down, um, this very, very rich discussion, uh, I'm feeling such gratitude to you all. It has been such an honor to be able to bring you together in this way. Dr. Vandana Shiva, uh, Bio Akamolafe, Sonali Kolhatkar, thank you for gracing our virtual halls. Jasmine, you does such excellent work moderating. Thank you for doing the honors tonight. Most grateful to you too. Um, I'd also like to thank our friends at Synergetic Press for all the great work they're doing. Sandy, Lisa, Doug, and of course, the director, Deborah Parrish Snyder, uh, thank you all. And finally, thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us this evening. As always, you help complete the circle. Um, I'd like to remind everyone we have posted links with which you may purchase books inside the chat function. Also, if you want to learn more about our authors, post the links to their websites. Tonight's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events, a publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Be well. We hope to see you all again very soon. Peace. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Bye.